Thank you, Matthias. So yes, my name is Thorsten Heffler, and now I have to, oh, wonderful. So my name is Thorsten Heffler. I am uh, from ETH Zurich, as we just heard. And um, I'm actually pretty new to this, but my colleagues at Microsoft, I'm uh, visiting them for the second year, year now, my colleagues at Microsoft thought actually it would be a very good idea to have a, a traditional systems person who just recently learned quantum computing try to explain quantum computing from a traditional systems person's view. And I designed a talk that's going to be very, very different uh, from the typical talks that people with a physics background give you. Uh, for example, there is no block sphere in the talk for the, for the physicists. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes, but, but please uh, bear with me. I'm also very new to that field. But what's my background? So my background is really high performance computing. So traditionally, I've been building very large computing systems like the Blue Water System in the United States used to be the largest system when it was built. Then I moved to Switzerland where we built the largest system that was in, um, or I, I helped uh, constructing that, that was uh, now in operation in Europe. I am one of the main authors of the MPI uh, 3 specification, building network topologies, blah, blah, blah. So at the end, I'm a high performance computing person. And high performance computing, um, we are covering a lot of ground in my lab, going from applications to programming systems to accelerator hardware. Another question could be obvious, like, why, the, why is this person looking at quantum computing? But in fact, pretty much the same applies to quantum computing. There's an application stack, an application problem, there's a programming system problem, and there's, of course, the hardware problem, which I understand least about, but fortunately we have Dave Wecker, <laughs> the last speaker in this session, going to talk about this in detail. So, but let me now give you the promised uh, kind of introduction, uh, a high-level view from a computer systems or HPC systems person to quantum computing. First of all, we need to define what a qubit is. And, and we all know what bits are, right? They have two states, they're in zero and one. And now, uh, if you want to look at a different configuration of the, or they could be in zero and one, sorry, if you no, look at a different configuration of these bits, we would write them in this kind of a slightly different notation in the vector notation. Um, so we basically say, well, in the ith position where i is zero or one, we put a one and all the other numbers uh, will remain zero. So that's just a small generalization. In fact, that makes no sense in classical computing whatsoever. Um, it, it just makes it more complicated, but it allows us to write uh, these qubits, or I'm sorry, to, to write the classical bits along two axes. So we have the classical um, one here and the classical zero here, and we now uh, visualize this as a wonderful two-dimensional system. For the physicists among you, you know this is uh, not true because there are complex numbers, but actually the complexity of the number or the, the complex nature of the number doesn't play such a big role in quantum computing. So then let's bear with me with the uh, standard real definition. So if we are now getting a little bit more into detail, uh, we call this uh, a state of a system, and we introduce two numbers, alpha zero and alpha one. And now we get a little bit more into this um, view, into this classical popular science kind of view where we can start defining that these, this bit could actually be in the two states kind of at the same time or we call this a superposition or the physicists call this a superposition because physicists are uh, amazing with naming things so superposition sounds just wonderful um, as opposed to NP-complete that I will talk about later. Um, so, and then, of course, since this is somehow a probability at the end, right, we have to talk about probabilities. So we really have to have the two states, the zero and one, adding up to one um, at the end because it's, it's either zero or one with a certain probability. But there is a small caveat to this. The caveat is that we have to use the square numbers because at the end these numbers are complex. So we use the, uh, the square of the magnitude has to add up uh, to zero or one. And this is actually, if you think deeply about it, where much of the power of quantum computing stems from because these numbers, alpha zero and alpha for one can be negative. So at the end, if we draw it in the, the view that I'm just uh, showing here, that we see that this is kind of a nice uh, a circle of, of possible positions in this 2D space that I'm uh, depicting here. So for example, the state could be there where both of these numbers are uh, negative, right? So that's one uh, potential state. What we can now say, well, we can also have the classical state of zero, which is basically here, and we can have the classical state of one, which is at the north of this. Those two states are uh, orthogonal, and now we see how the interaction between classical and quantum bits kind of works. So um, also we um, abbreviate these states in this, uh, this funny notation, which is called the Braquet notation in this particular case. Um, this is a ket, um, so the right side of a, of a dot product. Um, but, but that shouldn't uh, further worry you. You just, when, whenever you see one of those things, you just imagine it's a, it's a vector with lots of zeros and the one in the position the num of the number that uh, this, this shows me. I mean, one in this case or zero in this case, okay? So now we can rewrite this and simplify uh, the vector notation a little bit and um, uh, just use this in the future. So for example, one of those very important states 
that is now not a classically representable state, it's not zero or one, is this uh, so-called plus state, which is in fact the state where we have an equal probability for if observed for the qubit, uh, if we observe it to be zero or one. And we can depict it here as kind of in the middle between these zero and one vectors. There's also a minus state in this diagram would be down here. Right, so there are uh, many, many different states, but this is getting already into too much detail. So now, as you can imagine, um, oh, if you see this as a quantum uh, system, as an analog system in this sense, you can encode lots of information in these two complex or even real numbers. In fact, you can encode an arbitrary number of, uh, of bits into these numbers because it's, it's so far still an analog system. The only problem is that in the system, you can only, when you observe it, and so kind of go from the quantum state to a classical state, which, which we usually care about because at the end we live in a classical world, at least I do uh, live in a classical world, and that means we can only read one bit out of this. And this bit kind of follows the probability distribution of this um, alpha zero, alpha one uh, squared. And, and this is, by the way, it's called an amplitude, this alpha zero and alpha one. So it's not, a, it's not a probability itself, but if you square it, it becomes a probability. Furthermore, it's problematic with these qubits, so you cannot, it's just a no cloning theorem, so which means you cannot copy them and you could not sample the probability distribution to get an arbitrary number of bits out of that uh, thing again. So it's kind of useless as a data storage from a systems person's point of view, right? It sounds very nice, you could store a lot of data into it, but you could actually not get the data out of the system. So that's not uh, a very good data storage. So now we look at usually at multiple qubits, and multiple qubits, like traditional bits, live in a two to the n space. In the sense, if I give you a system with n bits, these n bits can in fact have um, take two to the n different values. And now that we establish that these qubits can be at the same time in these values, and so now it begins to smell rather powerful, at least to somebody as naive as I was last year. Um, so wonderful, we can use this notation that I've just introduced. Um, maybe we can uh, generalize this to n qubits. So we see an example with two qubits here, right? So we have a 0, 0, a 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Again, visualize this as a, as a vector, in this case, a four-dimensional vector that has a 0 uh, everywhere and a 1 at the respective position of this, this number that we can see here. So it's a very uh, simplified view. So now we can say, oh, wow, and now we have this wonderful exponential exponential computing power, two to the n things at the same time. And let me give you an example. And uh, again, to relate to traditional, uh, to classical co computer scientists, let's look at an adder. I, I believe everybody knows what an adder is. I, I in fact see many of my uh, architecture friends in the audience who I lured into this talk, um, telling that they will finally understand quantum computing, so <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, so here we have an adder uh, that takes two numbers, A and B, and produces a sum and a carry bit. Okay, this adder has logarithmic depth and linear work, so we know all of this. If I put a particular bit pattern into this adder out of the two to the n, uh, two to the two n, in fact, uh, combinations that I could add here, well, I will get a particular, of course, a correct output because it's a correct adder. So now I can tell you that I can take any classical circuit and translate it to a quantum circuit that can work on these superpositions at um, a linear overhead. Right? But the overhead is, in fact, not necessarily in terms of depth uh, and or work. It may be, but in this particular case, we can construct a quantum adder that has logarithmic depth and linear work. Great, so it's about the same. We have, again, two inputs, A and B. And these inputs now look slightly different, but I'll talk about this in a minute. And we will have additional input bits uh, that we call work bits or ancillas or scratch or whatever, but let's just ignore this for the purpose of this presentation. If you want to know more about this, ask the experts or, or, or ask me. Um, so what we do, uh, actually, what we can see here, all of these bits are in the zero state, right? So, so they come in as a classical zero. That's any quantum system or programming system today starts uh, with a classical zero state. And then we apply a gate to it that's called the Hadamard gate. And so something to get used to if you look at quantum computing, you, get, you have to get used to these, these gates. And they have nothing to do with the gates that you may think about as a computer architect. Think about those things as operations applied to things, or to, to these bits, okay? What does this Hadamard uh, operation do in this sense? Well, it takes the zero state and transforms it into the plus state that I've shown you before. So it takes every single bit and puts this bit in an equal superposition between zero and one. So now, if you would observe these, uh, this bit at, uh, these bits at this point here, we would basically get a very nice random number generator, right? an equally distributed random number generator, okay? So and we can write this in this uh, cat notation that I've introduced before, but you can also ignore this. Okay, so what, and this adder at the end will give us a state that then produces as the result of the addition, okay? So this uh, just works. So for and some additional bits that I've just been uh, ignoring so far and I will keep ignoring. The problem comes now in the system 
Like before on the first slide, well, if we want to, actually, oh, so sorry, if we, we can actually concretize this to two bits here, two out input bits and two output bits, and of course an output parry, uh, carry bit. So the problem now comes in this case, if we want to observe what the system has done. So as soon as we want to print what the system has done, the state uh, so, uh, has a, a collapsing effect, so it collapses to one particular value where, we, uh, where it kind of chooses for us, one A, one B, and one A, and one A plus B on the output. For example, it may choose this bit pattern. It may choose another bit pattern. It will always be the correct addition of these numbers in the, uh, at, the, um, at the left. And, and of course, it's not ret retrospectively choosing the left side. I, I understand, but again, I'm simplifying here. So we will get the correct output A plus B here, but it'll be non, we have no influence on what output we get. So it's sampling from a random distribution. So at this sense, we still have a random number generator, but it's always biased towards the correct output for whatever input it selects. So it may even choose the same uh, input. So this means we now constructed an adder that can add two to the n numbers at the same time, and it really does that. But the problem is as soon as we want to get our number out, we will get one of the two to the n combinations. You can generalize this. Uh, was a, a uh, a physicist slash mathematician in the 70s, Hulevo, who actually generalizes that you can at most extract n classical bits out of a quantum system that requires two to the n um, um, complex numbers to be represented. So this is basically what I'm just showing you with this adder. You will at most get n classical bits when you observe the quantum system. So this is a little bit um, limiting, as you can imagine. So you can do all these additions or all these operations on this quantum state, but you will only get a very small number of bits out. So I, I myself conclude from this, and, and we can talk about this later, I would say a practical quantum uh, system has to somehow read a linear or maybe polynomial size input, then operate on an exponential size state space because you want to have speed up over classical computing, right? Because these things are expensive. And then at the end, again, produces kind of a polynomial size or linear size, I mean, whatever, I mean, uh, linear is of course polynomial, but a small output, right? That is then likely to be measured, right? So we, we compute with probabilities at the end. This is also something that you need to hear many, many times before you really understand what's going on. Um, okay, so that kind of sounds uh, like that quantum Quantum algorithms are really good at solving problem where a solution is verifiable efficiently. And if you had uh, any undergrad class in theoretical computer science, you would be immediately like, yeah, I know these problems. These are called NP-hard problems or NP-complete problems. So they have polynomial size input, polynomial size output, and they have a very large state space. Wonderful. So let's check if quantum computers can solve polynomial time problems. In fact, that was when I came here, I had this illusion that this was a wonderful uh, thing to do and, and we would revolutionize uh, all of computing with this, of course. Um, unfortunately, uh, there are some limitations, mainly the linearity of the operator, that uh, make it appear unlikely that this is going to happen. Since we cannot really prove that classical uh, computing cannot solve uh, NP-complete problems in polynomial time, we can also not make the same statement for quantum computers because they're strictly more powerful than classical computers, obviously, because you can still compute with the zero and one state, right? So there's just more states you could compute with. Um, however, we don't really know how to use the power of quantum computation to achieve this. And, and it seems even that, that this is very hard to do. There is, though, a new, in, if you're a theoretician, a new complexity class um, that was introduced for that uh, computation. So it's not so new anymore in 2018, but, but it used to be new in the, in the context of quantum computation, this bounded error quantum polynomial time. So this is basically the class of algorithms that you can solve with a bounded error, because all of quantum computing is statistical, um, that you can solve in polynomial time. And what do I mean by polynomial time? By the way, if you're not a theoretician, basically means that if I have a, an input with uh, n bits, it solves it in time, in time in the sense of number of operations, in n to the k, where k is a constant, in at most n to the k, okay? So to give you a slight uh, background on, on complexity theory, and, and again, that's uh, probably clear to most of you, so quantum computers somehow live in the complexity class of p-space. So that was actually an, an exciting proof that you, that you could prove that quantum computers are not more powerful than p-space. So what does p-space mean? Well, it's the same, uh, or it's, it's similar to polynomial time, but it's all the problems I can solve in polynomial space. Okay, then there is this well-known class of NP that's a subset of p-space that basically means these are all the classes of problems that I can check a solution in polynomial time. Of course, that means that the solution itself is of polynomial size because otherwise I couldn't even look at it in polynomial time. Then there's the well-known class of P, which is where the class of problems where I can uh, build the solution or construct the solution in polynomial time. Then there is uh, the set of NP-complete problems, which you, which you all know. Um, so these are polynomial time reducible among each other. We don't really know if these classes are all the same, right? So this is the famous million-dollar problem. 
Um, then there is this class BQP, which obviously in includes P. And then there is this wonderful example instance of a factoring or discrete logarithm, so Schwarz algorithm, uh, using um, quantum Fourier transform as, as one of its main components, where we can actually solve uh, quantum computing with quantum computing very hard problems that we don't know how to solve classically. And then, even more interesting, there are some algorithms that I don't, uh, that, that nobody quite knows whether you can solve them with quantum computing or not, but they lie in the class uh, NP intermediates, so somehow between these two, okay? But now, uh, I'm not a theory person, I'm a hardware or a kind of systems person, as I told you before, uh, high performance computing systems. So let's look at the, how to build a quantum computer. So how to build that machine? Well, obviously, it is a very, very, I mean, not obviously, but, but as you know, quantum effects only happen in very isolated environments. So this is the major problem of building uh, quantum computers in practice. This is why you put them in a cryostat at a milli Kelvin temperature. So this is an extremely cold temperature, and then Based on the construction of this cryostat, you have multiple different uh, temperature levels where you could uh, place different components of your quantum computer at. Um, of course, the qubits have to be at the lowest level, but now you can decide how to actually design the overall system at the different temperature levels. Eh? You could get different technologies involved in building a quantum computer. And uh, this is what I now want to briefly um, summarize or briefly give a, a systems overview. And we will hear more about this uh, from, uh, from the second speaker, Margaret, um, who will be talking more about the systems aspects of this. So, but let me give you four layers that I think are very significant layers in building an actual quantum computing system. So it ranges from the logical layer where you program. You have to have a programming language down to the physical control where you actually implement um, quantum computing um, uh, operations. And um, I'm categorizing them into the the quantum space, the traditional bits space, and the what kind of abstraction are we working with? So in the qubit space at the programming level, we program with these quantum circuits that I haven't really had time to explain, but um, just uh, trust me, that's, that's an, an interesting way to program these systems. And it is very unnatural somehow uh, to, to traditional computer scientists, but it is actually uh, useful in that context. So you, of course, combine these quantum circuits with classical control flow because you have to because they are not powerful enough by themselves. And, and I can go into more details, but, but please talk to me offline. And then you have some kind of programming language that is an abstraction that's uh, Q-sharp or Scaffold that we will hear about in the second talk. So there are many of these languages. But at the end, there is always an intermediate representation that translates these languages to something else. So then at the, at the second level, um, we have various uh, gate synthesis approaches. I don't have enough time to talk about them in detail, but if you have any questions about this layering, again, contact me offline. But this is a very interesting uh, mathematics problem like this uh, further uh, down layer, this quantum error correction, which will probably be implemented in a real machine with microcoded instructions at the end. But this is, again, an architecture decision. At the very low level, you have uh, physical gates, physical controls, and they're usually controlled with some kind of pulses at this uh, machine. So what we can see here is actually a stack that looks very similar to the standard system stack. So we have a software layer at the very beginning. We have a set of middleware layers that look very different from the traditional middleware layers, but they have the same purpose. And we have a hardware layer at the very bottom. So we could actually establish a whole ecosystem like we know this from uh, tr classical computing here in the quantum computing field. And this is, in fact, what Microsoft Research, or, uh, sorry, Microsoft Quantum um, does at, at a rather interesting scale. So let me give you one example of a quantum algorithm because I promised you to give you some intuition. So far I told you about these bits and whatnot and how you, how you do all of this, but it's not really clear how you get the information out of the system at the end. So I want to give you a, a very small example, a very small example that I consider useful. <laughs> okay, usually the, the small quantum examples are not too useful. So let me see if this works. Uh, and, and please provide me feedback in case you're new to this. If, if you already know all of this, this is not going to be too exciting. Um, so Grover search. Grover search is, is the, the simplest quantum algorithm that I would consider um, useful, but we can argue about this. And so how does it work? I give you a function, a black box function f of x, where I tell you it takes a certain input domain or a certain a, a uh, inputs from a certain domain and produces outputs in a certain codomain. Okay, let's just assume it could be integers or something like this. Um, then I give you the task of finding, and I give you an element in the codomain and ask you to find the corresponding element in the domain. And let's say I, want to, uh, I tell you it's a bijective function, okay? So it's a one-to-one -one mapping. Uh, it's not uh, too complicated. Um, obviously, in classical, you would require, uh, in the worst case, to test all of these examples because you can't look at the function itself. You can just test 
this domain one by one for all the examples. In classical, I can tell you we can do this with square roots of the size of the domain because we can basically test it in the superposition. We can actually get the result in a single shot. We just don't get it out. In order to get it out, you need a square root number of trials in order to extract the problem from the quantum computation. Here I show you a full Q sharp code. So Q sharp is awesome. So you should totally go to the, the demo in case you missed it. I hope there's still somebody after this session. Um, to, to learn about Q sharp, if you, if you have missed the demo, you can actually download it and play with it yourself. I, I learned it within a couple of hours, actually. It's very productive. So I wrote this algorithm uh, in, in a couple of hours. But the idea is now you allocate a bunch of qubits, basically the number of bits of your uh, domain size. And that gets you, here are all these, all these qubits. And so, so they range from the zero bit to, to all ones. And here's the probability or the, the amplitude, OK? So of course, when I initialize this, they will all be uh, deterministic zero. And as I go forward, we apply this gate that I told you, this Hadamard gate, which puts them in an equally likely superposition. So now all the qubits are at the same time, kind of all the possible 2 to the n input values. So then what I do is I apply an, an interesting oracle that will just take advantage of the quantum nature of the problem that I can actually have negative amplitudes. That's one of the big powerful features. Otherwise, it would be as powerful as classical um, probabilistic computing, because probability is always positive. But in quantum, probabilities somehow, amplitudes, can be negative. The wonderful thing that's happening now is I have an operator where I can reflect all of these probabilities at the average of, themsel uh, of, of those probabilities, which will kick the ones that I don't want down and my average up. This is the element I actually care about. So and then I do this again, right? So I flip this again, and I run this average down here, and I do this again, and I will ampli uh, amplify that one amplitude. And if I now measure the system after I've run um, square root of n iterations of this, if I measure the system, I will observe the correct value. So this is, sounds like magic, but this is actually, you can fully understand this uh, with a bunch of uh, math. So in that sense, uh, it gets more com much more complicated than this. I have no time. Matthias is already standing there and ready to kick me off the stage. Um, so just to show you a, a real result on a real computer where we actually did all the math of mapping it to a real machine, um, assuming a very low error rate, which is a total dream right now, and a very uh, low gate time, um, we get a, a speed up over classical at about 50 bits. Okay? You cannot solve AES with this, so, so you, you, some algorithm still remains safe. OK, so let me wrap up to give you some insight into real applications, because what I showed you, Gro Grover's search, is, is a part of a real application. It can be used in the context of many applications. I'm very hopeful for this. But the classical application is uh, quantum chemistry. Right? This is the original idea of, um, uh, of, of Feynman, who came up with the whole idea of quantum computation. So this is most likely to succeed. Then we have, of course, breaking encryption. You do this once, and then nobody will care about it. Like a year later, like this, this use case will be gone. We can accelerate heuristical solvers. This is exactly where Grover plays a big role that I, that I just demonstrate to you in a minute. And quantum machine learning is very a very interesting research topic. I don't see exactly how it would work right now, but it has an extremely interesting, um, well, extremely interesting set of ideas where you could go. And with that, I would like to thank you. And I don't think I can get any questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm here all day.